anything on this subject then uh, this afternoon, uh, did Jesus exist before he was born? And I guess this is a, a topical talk because of the time of year uh, that we're giving it. And, uh, and really, it came out of uh, some thoughts around uh, nativities. Um, I had the, the privilege of going to my daughter's first nativity uh, uh, at school, and uh, as schools tend to do in, uh, in the UK, um, they, will, um, uh, they will sing hymns, and uh, they sang this one. Uh, uh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant, O come ye, O come ye to Bethlehem, come and behold him, born the King of Angels, O come let us adore him. Christ the Lord. Um, and uh, what was interesting is that there, there seems to be, um, uh, within the, the, the sort of church hymns that they've got, uh, a bit of contradiction with what the Bible teaches, because it talks in verse 2 there about God of God, speaking of Jesus, light of light, low he of whores, not the virgin's womb, very God, begotten, that is, born, but not created. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord. Um, so, so there was that one, uh, and also this one, Once in Royal David City, which is a, 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 a nice carol, um, uh, and, uh, 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 but the issue sort of comes in verse 2, where it talks about the Lord Jesus. He came down to her from heaven, who is God and Lord of all, and his shelter was a stable, and his cradle was a stool, with the poor and mean and lowly lived on earth, our Saviour holy. And, uh, and yet, of course, whilst it's describing Jesus as God there, it acknowledges, if you look at verse 4, uh, for he is our childhood's pattern. Day by day like us he grew. He was weak, little weak, and helpless. Tears and smiles like us he knew. And he feeleth for our sadness, and he shareth in our gladness. So it's the idea that Christ, or the Lord Jesus, uh, grew as a child, um, he was little, he was weak, but he grew and developed and had that empathy uh, with all of us. So it, it seemed to me that when, uh, when we actually look at the, the, the hymns that uh, are sung in perhaps schools or, or churches around the country, uh, this time of year especially, um, it can be quite confusing to understand the role of uh, the Lord God and the role of Jesus. Uh, and of course, to understand these things properly, we need to turn to the Bible. Now, if you uh, looked under the Jewish view of God uh, within the Old Testament, you would see there, um, very emphatic, at least that there is one God only. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 39 says, that, Know therefore this day, and consider it in thine heart, that the Lord, he is God in heaven above and upon the earth beneath. There is none else. And of course, um, the, the context that, to which these words were being uh, read to the then newly formed uh, nation of uh, Israel, the Jewish people, uh, was in the context of the, the uh, way in which they had come out of the land of Egypt. Egypt, that of course, was known for its multiplicity of gods. God was trying to get his people to focus on him only, uh, rather than uh, many of the gods that were existing in those sort of pagan uh, times. Now, the subject that we want to look at um, this evening is uh, whether Jesus existed before he was born. And uh, actually, this topic arose as a result of some discussions with a, a friend that had come along to one of our meetings, a chap called Dave. Um, perhaps some of you might, uh, might remember Dave. Um, he absolutely loved reading his Bible, and you could tell that just by speaking to him. And uh, from reading his own uh, Bible, um, he understood that, uh, well, a belief in the Trinity, that is to say that God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are all equal but different, he, he saw that that didn't make sense. He, he could show from the, the Bible that God and Jesus were clearly distinctive, distinctive he would go to, to verses like John chapter 14, where uh, Jesus is, 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 is reading and he's saying, uh, you have heard me say to you, I'm going away and coming back to you, speaking to his disciples. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said, I'm going to my father, 
my further is greater than i. Um, then uh, he would also go to uh, verses like this, uh, talking about the Lord Jesus uh, when he was in uh, Gethsemane before his crucifixion. In prayer to God, his Father, Jesus said, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So, so Jesus and God had two separate wills. Jesus wanted to avoid death at all possible. Um, but the Lord God, his Father, allowed it to happen for the, for the saving of the world. There are other verses as well that he, he, he took us to. He, uh, he pointed out 1 Timothy chapter 6, which speaks about God, that him alone has immortality, dwelling in approachable light, whom no man has seen or can see. Uh, and uh, perhaps one more, Mark chapter 13, verse 32, which I think it's, uh, you know, quite clear, isn't it? Yeah, Jesus says about the time of his return, he says, Of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So, so God's understanding of when Jesus was going to return was different to uh, the Lord Jesus and also different to the angels as well. And Dave could see that the church is around, despite all their good intentions, at looking at what uh, the Bible was saying in these passages. And so he was actually quite intrigued when he understood what uh, Christadelphians believe uh, about the Bible to be the word of God, and that we base our beliefs solely on what it teaches. And in our discussions with him, it became apparent that on the one hand, although he didn't believe in the Trinity, he felt the Bible taught that Jesus existed before his birth. That, in fact, Jesus was the first thing God created, a spiritual being. Uh, to use, if you like, Dave's words, uh, he felt that it was at the beginning of time, God was the architect and Jesus before man. And the whole of creation was created in that way. And, uh, and Dave really wasn't getting here. This is what... Uh, he understood some of the Bible verses were, were teaching him. And uh, if you like, he went to these puzzling passages, uh, such as John chapter 1, verse 1, where it talks about, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, he was in the beginning with God. And uh, the Word, he said, identified with Jesus. He took us to uh, uh, another one, John chapter 8, verse 58, where Jesus is speaking to uh, the Pharisees, describing um, the fact that uh, he existed. Uh, Most assuredly, I say to you, says Jesus, before Abraham was, I am. So, so speaking to the Jews, uh, Jesus was declaring to them that in somehow, some way, he existed before Abraham. And there are the, a few other verses that uh, Dave took us to, such as Colossians chapter 1 where it describes Jesus as the image of the invisible God. And, uh, and, and by him, all things were created in heaven and earth, um, visible and invisible. Hebrews chapter 1, God who at various times in various ways has spoken in time past to uh, the fathers by the prophets, uh, and speaking about the Lord Jesus, that God has appointed him heir of all things, for whom also he made the worlds. And perhaps one more. Um, Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, where it says, well, Revelation is a book about uh, symbols and signs, but it says there, to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, speaking again about the, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so quite a barrage of references for us to try and understand. And, uh, and I guess, where, where do you start in all of this? Well, I suppose the first thing to, to think of to start off is to think, well, do these things actually matter? Does it matter what we believe on this topic, whether Jesus existed before his birth or not? And I think uh, uh, the Bible tells us, yeah, absolutely, it does matter. It does matter what we think about God and Jesus. John chapter 17 tells us this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So understanding that relationship of the only true God 
And that of Jesus Christ is, a, is an essential thing. And uh, that understanding has to come from the inspired word of God alone. Uh, and I suppose, secondly, is that if you believe that uh, Jesus somehow existed prior to his birth, that he had some immortal spiritual existence prior to being born, well, that has implications, doesn't it, on what his death and resurrection means for us. It suggests that we have an immortal being becoming mortal and then immortal again which I, th I think takes away from the impact and the significance of what Christ's uh, death and sacrifice and resurrection uh, achieves. It, it also raises the, the question that the promise of immortal life that the gospel speaks a lot about, um, it teaches us, well, that might not necessarily be the case if the, if the immortal can somehow become mortal for a time and then become immortal again. And uh, in all of these things, there's a, a scriptural principle to, to so, sort of bear in mind, and it's found in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, which says, however, spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward, spiritual. The majority of, if not all of these puzzling passages, if you like, which suggested perhaps that Jesus existed in some way before his birth, but he had a part to play in the creation. We're taken from the New Testament, and uh, what I think we'll find out is that they have a spiritual significance. Because, of course, the, the creation account that we read about in Genesis, the first book of the Bible, mentions nothing about the creation of Christ there. It doesn't mention that Jesus created and so on. But, of course, it does hint at a saviour to come as a result. And I guess this is really the heart of the question. Did Jesus exist before he was born? Well, these lines and to get us thinking, um, let's just think about some Old Testament characters and ask the question of them. Did they exist before they were born? And we could look to uh, prophet Jeremiah, who we read about in Jeremiah 1 verses 1 to 8. And uh, there we're introduced to uh, the fact that God says about Jeremiah, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and ordained thee to be a prophet of the nation. So, so God was choosing Jeremiah uh, as a prophet to go and speak to his people long before Jeremiah had been born. Uh, and so the question then, did Jeremiah exist before he was born? Well, clearly the answer is no, but he was known in the mind of the creator. And interestingly, the time that Jeremiah was writing was the time of uh, an ancient king of Israel, King Josiah. And, uh, and Josiah, interestingly, was prophesied that he would eventually be a king by name and would have a role to play in God's purpose. And we could ask the question about Josiah as well. Did Josiah exist before he was born? Again, no, he's, uh, he's in the mind of God, known before of his role and what he would achieve and carry out in his life. And, uh, and therefore, he was not existing before he was born in that regard. Um, one more. Um, we could think about ancient uh, king, a non-Jewish king, uh, King Cyrus, who was a Persian. It's interesting what we read about uh, Cyrus in Isaiah, uh, the prophet Isaiah, chapter 44. Again, long before um, Cyrus uh, was, uh, was on the scene, Cyrus, that king that was famed in history for bringing the Jewish people, and releasing them from captivity, allowing them to go and return to the land of Israel to restore a, a broken down city of Jerusalem uh, to get it repaired and to give them a homeland. Um, chapter 44, verse 28 says, uh, uh, God says about Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built and to the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. Thus saith the Lord, to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, 
to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of king to open before him the two leaf gates, the gates shall not be shut. So it's the idea there that long before um, uh, Cyrus came on the scene, uh, God had uh, him as in his mind as part of his plan to, to restore the kingdom uh, of Israel and Jerusalem. And so from those examples, it's clear to see that time doesn't matter to God. He knows the beginning from the end. He, he knows these people by name. He, he knew what they would do long before they um, did them. And, and they did not exist in some mystical way before they were born. Um, but God knows all things. All things are known to him. And I guess we have to stop and appreciate uh, this with our subject this evening, that God isn't restricted by time or space, that Christ too was known to God before the world began. And we have a helpful um, sort of deep verse that we read about in Psalms that uh, reminds us that we shouldn't limit God with respect to time. Psalm 90 tells us, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And really, that, uh, that idea of God's eternity is, is unfathomable. Uh, you know, we can't comprehend it because we are people that are restricted by time. Uh, and God, as it were, lives outside of time. He exists outside of time. He's from everlasting to everlasting. And it's interesting that this psalm goes on to say that um, uh, a thousand years is as a day to God. It's just something that we can't get our heads around, that God knows the beginning from the end, that he can look at the beginning of time uh, and see the creation, as it were, and and then look right at the other end of time, his kingdom on earth with what he has promised. And he'll know who, who's, who's there, who's fit for that time, because they exist to him now. And I guess this uh, this this verse in Isaiah really sort of explains this, this um, these thoughts really for us, uh, where it says about God, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And and I guess um, it was with that sort of. Uh, a misunderstanding, if you like, a, a lack of understanding that uh, the Sadducees, a group of Jewish uh, elders, if you like, that were influenced by uh, the Greek uh, sort of customs and philosophies of the day, they came to Jesus with a question. And it was a question about resurrection. They came to him, um, and we read about this in Matthew chapter 22, a question about resurrection where whereby they, they, they didn't actually believe in the resurrection. They, understand, they, they, they wanted to understand how it would practically work. And they give Jesus this sort of um, hypothetical scenario where um, this married man um, died and, and left his wife. And the Jewish custom is that uh, brothers of this man should uh, marry their wife so that her inheritance would not run out. Um, so that it wouldn't um, wouldn't wouldn't um, wouldn't ever fall away, and uh, and they pose the question to Jesus. Well, well, in the resurrection, when all these uh, people are raised, well, whose whose husband is she, will she be? Will she be um, uh, the brother's husband or the actual uh, uh, man who she first marries? And uh, and it's interesting how Jesus um, responds to this this question. He says, you know, have you not read what God has, 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 has put about the resurrection? Um, and, and we read about this in Matthew chapter 22, verse 32, where Jesus says of God, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not a God of the dead, but of the living. Um, that although God is married, the certainty of the resurrection is sure. Uh, and this is how the Gospel of Luke puts it. God is not a God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. And I guess what Christ was driving at is that the very promises that God had given to men like Abraham and his family, they were fully based on giving life 
where, humanly speaking, uh, there was no hope at all. And yet what was required were for those that feared God, for them to put their complete trust in him. So in, in thinking about Abraham and his wife, well, we know that they were well into their old age and childless. There, there seemed no hope of, of life or, or, or a descendant to come. And yet God promised that, uh, that he would be a father of a great nation and that all families of the earth would be blessed through him and his wife, Sarah. And faith was required. Abraham and Sarah and God provided a son in their old age. And when Abraham was called to Isaac as a sacrifice, faith was required. And, and Abraham would have done it. He would have gone through with killing his son. But instead, of course, God provided a ram caught in the thicket. And God knew that um, he had provided Abraham a way out. And this is something which is, is brought together for us in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 4, which speaks about faith. Those, those promises coming real. And, uh, we read there, therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be certain to all the descendants uh, of, of Abraham, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations, and of him whom uh, you have believed. It goes on to say, God gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And so Jesus, in explaining this to, to the Pharisees or the Sadducees, if you like, um, was explaining that um, the resurrection is true, that all uh, people live, as it were, to, to God. God wants and knows the resurrection of the dead. He, he understands who will be raised. And all live, if you like, to him. And, uh, and the fact that uh, you had uh, one man married many, many wives or one wife married many, many men, um, that was neither here nor there because we know in that time, that coming kingdom, there shall be neither marriage in marriage. Marriage won't be a thing. A different relationship uh, with the Lord Jesus. And so moving this on to think about uh, Christ, we realize that, that Jesus was the fulfillment of those promises made to Abraham so very long ago, that just as God promised that sin and death would ultimately be got rid of, abolished, so God knew how this would be done and his only begotten son. God so loved the world, we read in John chapter 3, verse 16, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So, where we read in, in John chapter 8, which we briefly mentioned about Christ explaining to the Jews that Abraham rejoiced to see his day, and he saw it and was glad. We see an inference, don't we, to Abraham offering his only begotten son, Isaac, and that there was a saving from death because of that future Lamb of God. And so before Abraham was, I am, Jesus said. Not that he said before Abraham uh, was, I was, or that I existed, but that Jesus, in the continuing purpose of God, knew that he was that saviour for mankind, just as that ram saved Abraham's son. And so, known to God before the world was even created, was this fact, the divinely appointed Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's with these thoughts that helps us appreciate verse five, Revelation 13, verse 8, speaking of the, the reaction of those when Christ comes to the earth. For it says, all who dwell on the earth will worship him. His name is in the book of life uh, from the lake slain on the foundation of the world. So it's an understanding that, you know, Jesus wasn't slain at the very 
beginning and dawn of time, but as it were in the mind of God, uh, this fact was known. This in no way takes away from the, the choice which Christ in offering his life as a, as a free will sacrifice for, for us, but that we marvel at God's wisdom and love towards us, whereby we can say after these words in Romans, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, and searchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? It was always in the purpose of God to reconcile sinful men and women through the sacrifice of his son. And this, of course, had to be explained at the very start, if you like, of Christianity. In Acts chapter 2, verse 22, the Apostle Peter says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you, by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God has raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. And so it was explaining that it was in the foreknowledge of God that Jesus would be that sacrifice for the world. And similarly, Peter in his epistle that says that, you no, know, those people that are, are faithful, they weren't, they weren't saved by corruptible things like silver and gold and money and wealth uh, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. But what we were redeemed by was with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. And so it's quite humbling and should be. I think that these things were done for us. But the reality of it is that just as God knows these things before we need, we even need them or even ask for them, so that we, like Jeremiah, like Josiah uh, and Cyrus, are all known to God well before the day of our birth. We have been chosen long before we were born to come away from a place uh, of sin in this world, which is which the world is so full of, and instead come near to God through Christ. If you've got your Bibles in front of you, please turn to Ephesians uh, chapter 1, because we have here in this epistle that uh, Paul writes to the, um, uh, the Ephesians here in chapter 1, um, some quite remarkable passages which help us really appreciate um, the responsibility that we have having been chosen by God now that we each had in type to, to, to get rid of, to put to death that former way of life uh, and instead that we have been called into a new existence, a new way of life in the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you just look at uh, Ephesians chapter 1 and verses 1 to 6, there you will see that we are chosen in the Lord Jesus before the world began. We are predestined. Our, our lives are known to God from the, the beginning to the end. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? To, to realize that uh, God has chosen each one of us. It's not a choice, uh, you know, whether we do right or wrong, whether we, 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 we love and uh, adhere to what the Bible teaches or not. Um, but known to God are these things. And similarly, if you went to over to chapter 2, and those first few verses in chapter 2, it explains that we're uh, once dead. We've been given this new life. We've been made alive, quickened. And this, of course, this symbol of, of, of this death and new life is, is seen in what baptism means, of a dying with Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ, to have a mind which is now focused on, on spiritual things uh, rather than earthly things. As we mentioned, you know, first the natural and the spiritual. Uh, and then interestingly, if you just uh, glance down at uh, verse 10 of he Ephesians chapter 2, 
it says that we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It calls us his workmanship as if we are clay in the potter's hands, that we are molded to his likeness. And the same idea of being a new creation in Christ comes throughout this, this letter. Chapter 3, speaking about uh, non-Jews, Gentiles becoming fellow heirs of the promises. Paul writes that this fellowship was something that God had intended from the creation of world. As to the man see, what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. And, uh, and then throughout the rest of this epistle, says that you've got to put on a new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And so this idea of Christ being the new creation, the beginning of a new creation, isn't just restricted to uh, this short epistle uh, that God uh, has given for us here in Ephesians. It's also a principle that applies uh, throughout Scripture. Corinthians chapter 5 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. We've, we've got a new set of values, if you like. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled to us to himself through Jesus Christ, who has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So with these things in mind, when we, if you like, what perhaps appeared to be at the first uh, puzzling verses, we can, we can see this principle in practice. You know, think about that, that verse that we read in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, where it describes Jesus as the image of the invisible God. It says all things were created uh, that are in heaven and earth, um, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, principalities or powers. All things were created through him, the Lord Jesus, and for him. Well, we can understand what that's talking about now, can't we? Because we, we see a little bit of context in, in verse 13, where it says that we are translated into the kingdom of his dear son. So it's as if we are, are living in the kingdom now through what Christ has done. Not that we're in the kingdom now, but the certainty, the assurance of the kingdom is without doubt. And what has Christ created? Well, is, is, is it talking about natural things of plants and animals and rivers and oceans? Speaking of, uh, of powers and rulership, of governance. See, see Christ has, has created the potential for this whole world to be changed to a way of a new life with God's principles at heart. But the powers of heaven have been arranging events looking towards this magnificent time because of the certainty of fulfilling uh, these promises. So uh, we see there in, in verse 18, it qualifies it for us that God, uh, that Christ is the, the image of God because he consistently showed perfectly those godly characteristics. He's the, the firstborn of creation. He's the, the head of the body who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And so he was the first to be raised from dead, the dead to newness of life. He was the beginning of a new creation without sin. And we could again look to uh, Hebrews chapter 1, where it talks about Jesus as being heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. And we see the context is about the inheritance of, of, a, of a brand new world. And we know that the, the verse in Acts, that uh, it was God who created heaven and earth, the world or the, the age that created uh, that uh, was created by Jesus is a world of life after death. So, so briefly then, when we when we come to consider the beginning of the Gospel of John, what are we reading about? It's a new beginning, isn't it? But now it's a it's a it's a focus on the Lord Jesus. That's what the Gospel is all about. That's what we're being introduced to. And what we're looking at is a contrast between the, the natural order of things to a new spiritual creation where Christ is the start of that new life. To remind you of uh, John chapter 1, 
verse 1 there. Christ is that new beginning. Just as when God spoke in the beginning and in the creation of the world, and it was done. Um, so Christ, too, the word made flesh, go on to obey the will of his father, being like his father and doing all that was asked of him because he was in the, the foreknowledge of God to do that. And we, we're given, aren't we, in these uh, these first few verses in John chapter 1, the example of the creation of light, just as the, the creation of light brought about life. So Jesus, who is the, the light of the world, now offers us hope of eternal life. As in verse 10, uh, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. How was the world made by Jesus? Well, the world was made by him, by him, because of his sacrifice for the world. And uh, it's, it's verse 12 that describes this making, this, this new creation process. As, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. He's created new children, new sons and daughters to those that believe in his name. Distinction, of course, um, in verse 18, which places the difference between uh, the Lord Jesus and God. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. And so this Lamb that was in the mind of God, slain from the foundation of the world, has created a new hope of obedience which he learned. We told aren't we, that he grew in favour with God. Words which describe a depressing character. Not that he had a, this character before. We have a new and living way where we start as our Father. And all things are in the Father's hands. He has given judgment to his Son, something which God has ordained of old and involves each one of us. God has appointed a day on the which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this all by raising him from the dead. And so we need to wait for that time faithfully. A great example set before us when we shall be invited to share with our king in those great promises of old. We read in Matthew chapter 25, then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. 